It's July 4th weekend, and we didn't want the holiday to come and go without acknowledging God's blessings upon us. Uh, I don't believe you can rightly understand our nation without acknowledging the blessings of God. The liberties we have enjoyed, the freedoms, the abundance, the opportunities, the things that have defined our lives, I believe, are a result of the blessing from the hand of God. Uh, that's the truth. I know they also represent tremendous sacrifices that have been made by the generations who preceded us. One of the things I have come to understand is every generation has to make a choice for themselves. We have to decide if we will stand for liberty and freedom and godliness and righteousness. We may inherit those things, but they won't be extended to the generations who follow us unless we as a generation make those decisions. So it seemed appropriate this weekend to take a moment to acknowledge the goodness of God and the blessings of God and to say thank you to Him. I would submit to you for too long we have gobbled up the blessings and tried to avoid the responsibilities. And that if we don't change that pattern, we will forfeit our liberty and freedom. Amen. Amen. Governments don't give liberty and freedom to their citizens. Those things come from God. I've studied history, and there's a long line of expressions of governments and forms of governments and different nations and different empires. And there just simply is no pattern of governments extending liberty and freedom to their citizens. Those things come from the hand of God. It's recognized in our founding documents that we're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Those don't come from governments, they come from God. And the governments do their best to usurp those things. And we as citizens and people of faith have to watch over them to see that they are protected for our children and grandchildren. And so I'm grateful for your lives. I believe the hope for our future is the church far more than politicians or political parties. I believe God's answers may be revealed in those ways, but it begins in the hearts of His church. So for our offertory prayer this morning, I wonder if we could join together in just thanking God. We are blessed people. We have so much food, there's too much of us. We have so much stuff, we have to rent rooms to put it in. We have so many opportunities, we're exhausted most of the time. Right? Does that seem right? I know there's problems and challenges and difficulties, but the blessings of God are all around us. And we don't want to be, live presumptive lives. We want to be grateful. You know, there are many voices that tell us it's not fashionable to love our nation. I could not disagree with them more stridently. I would submit to you it's the worst possible kind of leader the benefits from a circumstance and then does their best to turn the people they're leading against the, that nation that put them in those places of authority and power. It's evil. So we're going to take a moment to say thank you. If you'll stand with me, if you're watching, joining us on live stream or some other platform, please stand. Put down your cinnamon roll, your croissant, or your sausage biscuit. I've been in Israel, sausage biscuit sounds good, so. <laughs> God is so good to us. I thank God for you. You're the hope, folks. Men and women of faith, people with the courage to say, I believe in Jesus. Surely we can be at least as bold as the wicked. Surely. Hmm. Let's just take a moment and say thank you. Lord, we want to thank you. I thank you for this nation. I believe you called it into existence. Lord, I believe you gathered people with a heart for you, with a desire for a, a freedom of worship to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, and you brought them to these shores long ago. Lord, I believe you've raised up generation after generation of leaders that have led with sacrifice and courage and boldness, that have extended freedom and liberty to us generation upon generation. Men and women who have conducted themselves in such a way that it pleased you to continue to bless us. We thank you for that. Lord, we have so much. We have food and clothing and shelter and transportation and medicine and opportunities. Lord, you have kept us together and strong. You've given us the courage to stand against evil and wickedness and oppression. You've given us the humility to acknowledge our mistakes and to chart a, a pathway towards the future that was embracing godliness and holiness and righteousness. 
Lord, at every crisis, you have raised up a voice or given us leadership, or you have provided a pathway through. We acknowledge that today. Lord, you and you alone have kept us. We praise you for it today. As we pause this week to, to remember and to look back, we want to acknowledge, Father, your presence with us on this journey. And Lord, in humility today, we acknowledge that we have so often turned our backs on you. And we've lived selfish lives and godless lives. And imagine that we've made ourselves a success. Lord, forgive us. We come today not to accuse anyone else or to point a condemning finger, but to ask for your mercy upon our lives. Open our hearts again. Give us understanding into you and your character and your purposes in the earth. Provide us leaders once again from the, the most humble offices of the land to the most exalted. Men and women who fear your name, who will stand for righteousness and godliness and holiness and purity, who will speak the truth and deal with integrity. We thank you for it. Lord, only you can preserve us, but you are well able. And we ask you today to May God bless America again. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You should have received an outline when you came in. If you didn't, perhaps your neighbor would share with you. It's like a Christian idea. Or you can tear your outline into little pieces and hand it up and down the row. It's called socialism. <laughs> Don't send me a note. We just returned Friday afternoon from a trip to Israel. About 250 of us. We had a wonderful time. Um, I have made that trip a few times, but it always it has an impact upon my heart uh, to visit the land of Israel and to see the Jewish people and to be reminded of the vigilance that is required for them to maintain their freedom. They live in a tough neighborhood. Um, there's about 7 million Jews who live in the land of Israel. There's another million Israelis who are Arabs. But they're surrounded by tens of millions of people who are sworn to their destruction and their annihilation. That's not an opinion. The leaders of those nations boast about it in the press. Iran says frequently, just as soon as they can secure nuclear weapons, they will destroy the nation of Israel. And they live beneath that threat with a remarkable sense of joy and freedom. In fact, every time I visit, they seem to have found a new way to prosper. They found a better utilization for the resources they have. The desert is blooming. If you, took it a, if you look at a picture of the Middle East that's taken from high altitude, there's a green line, not a green line drawn by the United Nations. There's a green line where the, the land of Israel is just flourishing far beyond the nations around them. Uh, the, the greatest limiting factor for Israel throughout Scripture and into, into modern Israeli times has been water. The rainfall, they didn't have a natural source. They don't have the Nile River or the Euphrates or the Tigris. And, and they were limited to rainwater and what they could capture from that. But in the last few years, they've brought online several desalination plants. So for the first time in the history of Israel, they have an abundance of water. Uh, I've thought about that a good bit. I thought, God, is it another way they're looking for independence from you? Because the rainfall really was the governing agent for whether or not they would flourish. And I, I really, I felt like the Lord, it, it wasn't that it was an attempt to be independent or to rebel against God. I think God has a plan for them that will exceed the annual rainfall. So he's showed them how they can turn the ocean into potable water. God is blessing the land of Israel. There's two things I can tell you for certain God is doing in the earth. He's reestablishing the Jewish people in that piece of land that he promised Abraham he would give to his descendants forever. And the prophet Ezekiel tells us as he brings them back that he'll begin to clean up their hearts. The other thing he's doing and is in, of equal intensity is he's purifying his church. Uh, I think we've seen a new expression of that since COVID. We were kind of stuck in the quagmire of comfort and convenience, and we thought church should be comfortable and convenient, and beyond that, it was kind of an intrusion. And I believe God has begun to awaken us. Without a living faith in a real God, we have small hope in the future. 
And I'm excited about that because if God's beginning to awaken us, it's because he has an assignment for us. And I believe we will see a move of the Spirit of God that exceeds anything we've known in our lives. The topic for this session is Israel. It's the epicenter of spiritual warfare. Uh, that, that's not some new revelation, folks. You can track that through the history of Scripture. You can track that through the history of nations. There are so many spiritual forces that collide in Israel. If you're just marginally awake spiritually when you're there, you can become aware of that. As we were driving into town the first night, our driver took a street that was driving straight up in front of the, the, the U.S. consulate in West Jerusalem, and on the flagpole at the front of the consulate was the United States flag and the pride flag, and a huge banner celebrating Pride Month. That's what we're exporting to the world these days. But the culmination of this age will be acted out upon the stage in Jerusalem and the area surrounding it. That's a fact. God is fulfilling His promises to the Jewish people. He's gathering them for more than a hundred nations and causing the desert to bloom in spite of the hatred that's been directed towards them by the surrounding nations and the community of nations. It should be noted that Satan and his demonic host are striving to disrupt, to delay, or even destroy the purposes and the people of God. I hope you don't doubt that. Some of us have become too sophisticated, too educated, too affluent to believe in the devil anymore. <laughs> As if our refusal to believe in him would Remove us from the arena of his influence. I promise you, he believes in you. For thousands of years, God has been involved with the Jewish people and the land promised to Abraham and his descendants. I would remind you briefly that we are indebted in a tremendous way to the Jewish people. Without them, we would have no story. Because the book of Romans reminds us that theirs are the covenants of God, the promises, the prophets. Through them, God has given us scripture. Through the Jewish people, we have a Messiah. It's fashionable in many aspects of the church to say that the church, God has replaced the Jewish people in his purposes with the church. I believe that's a misunderstanding of scripture and a very destructive idea. The Bible teaches us that we've been grafted in, that the promises that God made to the Jewish people have been, become promises that inform our future. Not because we are special, but because we've been grafted into that original covenant. So far from setting them aside, they're at the center of what God is doing in the earth. I want to look at three separate things. The first two I'm going to touch quickly because I want to get to the third one in a bit more detail. But one of the ways of understanding what's happening in the earth today, both with the Jewish people and the people of God in general, is in terms of the promises of God, the blessings of God, and the judgment of God. And if you will listen quickly, I'm not going to read all those scriptures I gave you. You can relax. Some of you know me, if we read them all, we'd be here for dinner. But I want to start with the promises of God. Apart from the promises of God, your life and my life will be dramatically different. I'm an advocate for work, folks. I like a vision. I like a plan. I like effort. I like diligence. I like determination. All of those things are high on my list of, of things that I want to cultivate and include in my journey through time. But I will readily admit to you that the promises of God are the most hopeful part of my existence. You see, the promises of God inform us that there's something to be achieved or experienced which is candidly impossible without God's involvement. I hope you have a life plan that is dependent upon God's involvement. If your life plan is about what you can achieve and you can accomplish and what, what you feel like you can define success through your abilities, you are forfeiting the best part of your personality and your future. God's given all of us gifts and abilities and opportunities, but he has given us promises that offer us something that could only come from the hand of God. And if you're not living a life of faith that's pointed at receiving, qualifying, benefiting, meeting the conditions for the promises of God to be a part of your life, you are leading a diminished life no matter how much success you've had. I think we're experiencing that as a nation. I brought you just some samples of that. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, and I've told you many times that Genesis introduces us to the big rock ideas of the Bible. The rest of the Bible kind of fills in the story, but you're introduced to the principles in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 12, we meet Abram, and God said to him, if you'll go from your country and from your relatives in your father's house to the land I show you, I will make you a great nation. Now that's a promise. He didn't say, I'll make your business succeed. I'll give you a great idea. I'll give you some creative ability. 
or some athletic skills. He said, I'm going to make you into a great nation, not just a nation, not just a middling nation. I'm going to make you into a great nation. But he didn't stop there. I will bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Well, go big or go home, Abram. Everybody on the planet's going to be blessed through you. I'd call that a promise. Particularly by this point, he's a Bedouin. He's a traveling sheep herder living in a goatskin tent. Oftentimes, his Wi Fi doesn't work. And God said he's going to bless everybody through him. That's a promise. In Genesis 13, we get a bit more of the promise. The Lord said to Abram, if you lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, north, south, east, west, all the land you see, I'll give it to you and your descendants forever. We're several millennia on the other side of that. You know what? Abraham's descendants are living in that land. It's the most improbable of circumstances. A promise God made to him is being lived out in front of our eyes. Do you believe in the promises of God? Or do you think that's some sort of Hollywood drama or something that preachers dream up to try to, to ensure compliance to the set of rules that they're going to hold up before you? I think we've treated the promises of God pretty shabbily. We live as if there is no creator. We're willing to trust him with our eternity because we're far more interested in time. And so we just kind of blow past, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever comes after that, we're not really sure anyway. So if there's a promise out there, yeah, you can put my name down. But stay out of my way. I want to manage my life through time. I'll define the agenda. I'll, I'll decide what's right and wrong. I'll define what's moral and immoral. And we forfeit the promises of God. In Genesis 15, Abraham's still complaining a bit. His circumstances aren't changing very dramatically, and it looks like the promise that's been made to him won't be able to be fulfilled. And God comes back and says, don't be afraid, Abram. I am a shield to do to you. Your reward shall be very great. I wonder if you live with the imagination that God will reward you. I've been surprised. I've been in some pretty heated debates with people that would say to me, argue passionately that there really is no reward, that we all get the same thing. It's like heaven is government issue. <laughs> equity will reign. You know, equity is not a heavenly idea. It really is not. Equality, perhaps, equity comes from someplace else. But the promise of Scripture is that God will reward you if you will pursue him. And he said to Abram, I will see to it that your reward is great. The promise of God. I can make it a bit more personal from the New Testament, if you'll allow me. Galatians chapter 3 says, Christ redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Gentiles is the fancy New Testament word for everybody that's not Jewish. We don't share DNA with Abraham, but the blessing God gave to Abraham can come to us through our faith in Jesus the Messiah, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. In Matthew 5, Jesus gave us a promise. He said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He said, if people get torqued up with you because of me, you're blessed. Doesn't feel like a blessing. I've had people a bit torqued up with me because of Jesus. And I have to say, in the moment that that's being directed at you, that often does not feel like such a wonderful blessing. But he said, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Imagine if all the UT fans in the house are listening. I said to you, you could win the national championship if you'd be obnoxious. <laughs> There'd be no hesitancy. You'd wear nothing but orange and white and drive up and down through Alabama nonstop. <laughs> this is our year. Don't you know you're offending those people? You could care less. Don't you know you're hurting? No, you don't care. They have aspirations and dreams. Too bad. We win this year. But on your way home, detour through Georgia. Give them a taste, too. <laughs> How 
Why is it that as Christians, our primary concern has been that we don't offend? We'll bury every truth. We'll hide every reality. We'll do our best to... It seems to me we will yield almost any contentious place. We'll say our thoughts are changing. Maybe the, the Bible's out of date. Maybe our faith should be amended. How is it we've made compromise the ultimate virtue? There's a biblical word for that. It's called syncretism. It, it's when you, you don't reject your faith. You simply add to it the things that you need to to get along. Oh, we'll still worship God. We'll still offer a daily sacrifice at the temple, but we'll worship the Canaanite fertility gods too. You want us to put Baal in the loop? Sure, we'll put Baal in. It's hard to find a more accurate portrayal of contemporary American Christianity than that. I hope we can hear Jesus reward the, the words. There's a promise if we'll have the courage to stand for him. Now, with the promises of God come the blessings of God. It's a slightly different category. The blessings of God in your life or mine are outcomes which exceed reasonable expectations. When things happen to us that are beyond the sum of the parts, they're more than just good fortune or coincidences. We have outcomes when people look at us and go, that's just hard to believe. And the only real explanation is God blessed us. He gave me the opportunities, or he gave me the diligence, or he gave me a favorable response when I needed one, or he gave me an idea when I was up against a wall. And if we're arrogant and filled with pride, we'll imagine we're self-made people. But we know on the inside of ourselves that there's been something else at work. We've been blessed by God. We've lost a little bit of this in our nation. And I'm not pointing at the secularists. We've lost this in our churches. We've been reluctant to admit that God has blessed us. We're reluctant to talk about the exceptionalism of Jesus or the uniqueness of our nation and the contribution of faith to our freedoms and liberties. Again, because we want to be accepted by a diverse culture, and we think diversity is a greater value than our faithfulness to the truth. Folks, we have to come back and recenter. Being faithful to the truth of God should be the center compass point of our lives. Amen. The blessings of God. I brought you some examples in Genesis 39. There's a story about Joseph. Do you remember Joseph? Joseph was the youngest. He had several older brothers. It put him in a, in a diminished position. Inheritance would have gone to the eldest. So he's kind of at the bottom of the pecking order. But he's his father's favorite. So he's arrogant and prideful. Joseph's brothers sold him as a slave. That's called a dysfunctional family. <laughs> right? I mean, it wasn't like they ate his dessert, or they hid his homework, or they told stories about him on social media. They sold him as a slave. And he finds himself sold by Ishmaelite slave traders in Egypt. And there's a comment about Joseph in Genesis 39. It says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master, and when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And he put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. God blessed Joseph. It wasn't because Joseph had been to the Wharton School of Management. He didn't have a Harvard MBA. He's going to become the prime minister of Egypt, but it's not because of his outstanding resume. It isn't because he'd had the best education. Quite the opposite. He grew up as a spoiled, petulant, arrogant child. And then he went through the horror of having his family betray him at the most fundamental level. It's hard to imagine something that could cause you to be more torqued than that. He could have been filled with anger and hatred and resentment and bitterness, but somehow he avoided that. And he finds himself a slave in a foreign nation, and God blessed him. Do you have room to imagine God's blessing in the midst of circumstances that are less than ideal? You see, we get stuck here. We get focused on the ways that evil touches our life. We get stuck on the places where disappointment intrudes into our world. We had a plan, and our plan isn't coming about. And I don't like my circumstances, and I'm not going to serve God until he does what I want him to do. You've got your own version of that, but 
I've stood in the field on more than one occasion and shaken my fist at the night sky and said, I don't like the way you treat your friends. I've learned that God can withstand my rage about his poor job performance. But at the end of the day, I have to reconcile my relationship with him. And because Joseph could do that, it says that God blessed him. And he prospered wherever he went. Now, his path didn't get better immediately. He goes from that circumstance to something worse. He finds himself in prison. I didn't put the passages in your notes. Some of you know them. It says that God blessed him there, and he became in charge of all that was done in the prison. And he goes from the prison to the prime minister's office. And ultimately, he's restored to his family. God blessed his life. In spite of circumstances, in spite of evil, that's what the blessings of God are. Outcomes which exceed reasonable expectations. How many of you like the blessings of God? Me too. They extend from his promises. I'll give you a New Testament example. In Luke chapter 1, it says, it's speaking of Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're the parents of John the Baptist. John's father was a priest, and he's serving in the temple. It was his rotation. So he's serving into the temple. And an angel appears to him. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. He got an angelic messenger to tell him his prayer had been heard. Wow. Careful. I've come to the conclusion that when you have big interventions, it's because there's big guidance and big assignments coming. You know, I used to have the habit of saying, I used to take care of horses a lot in one season of my life. And I'd walk in the barn every morning and it was time to feed, so they'd start to make noises and I'd talk to them like they were people. And I used to walk around saying, one day one of my horses is going to speak to me. <laughs> and we had a person vis visiting my parents who was a lot more mature in the Lord than I was at the time. And she said to me, Alan, have you ever thought about the position Balaam was in when his donkey spoke up? <laughs> and I at least was humbled enough to say, I withdraw the request. <laughs> I don't want to get into that bad of a spot. But an angel comes to visit John and says, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you're to give him the name John. He'll be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. He'll be great in the sight of the Lord. Wow, child hadn't even been conceived yet. And the angelic messenger said, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Don't tell me they're not children. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. The blessing of God upon Zechariah and Elizabeth. The blessings change our lives. They bring outcomes that exceed reasonable expectations. Would you like the blessings of God? I'll tell you how to get them. The good news is you don't have to chase them. You don't have to beg for them. In fact, I would suggest you shouldn't pursue them. If you will make your life goal to honor the Lord, to walk uprightly before Him, the blessings will find you. That's the nature and the character of God. His desire is to bless those who walk uprightly before him. The scripture says that his eyes search the earth looking for men and women whose hearts are turned towards him. It's stated a little differently in Deuteronomy 28. I put it in your notes. It's Deuteronomy 28. It's a chapter of blessings and curses. And it says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord will set you on high above all nations on the earth. And all these blessings will come upon you and will accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. The blessings will overtake you. They will track you down. There used to be a trailer for one of the Indiana Jones movies. I forget which one of the 42 it was in, but <laughs> one of them. And Indy, Indy was running through a, a cave, this long cave, and behind him there was an enormous stone ball that looked like it was going to overtake him and crush the life out of him. That's my mental picture of the blessings of God. They are bearing down upon me. And if you want to watch the collision, just hang around. You don't have to chase the blessings of God. If you will determine that you're going to walk uprightly before the Lord, this is not easy. This is not simple stuff because there's a, a myriad of voices inviting you to ungodliness and a lot of internal messaging telling you you deserve it, helping you justify it. 
In our current culture, there are far more voices encouraging you to make a lifestyle choice that will bring something to you other than the blessings of God. But if you're willing to be different, and you're willing to honor the Lord in your life, in your relationships, in your heart, in the way you do business, how you conduct yourself, the blessings of God will come upon you. It's the scripture, we just read it. Even when evil touches your life, even when you should be filled with anger and rage and hatred and be demanding something of someone, the blessings of God will determine a completely different outcome from you. Become a person where the blessings of God come. I don't believe you can understand our nation and our story apart from the blessings of God. It's not our natural resources. There are many nations with abundant natural resources. It's not some special aspect of our character. We're a melting pot. We've come from the nations of the world. We were driven out of or unwelcome in most places of the world. And we came here and in our brokenness and what we didn't have, somehow with God's blessing, we've become the most prosperous nation in the history of civilizations. We have more freedom and more liberty. We're more diverse. Oh, I understand we don't celebrate those things. Hatred at the moment has the microphone. But their message is a lie. The blessings of God. Now there's one more component of this story and I wanna take the balance of our time with it. It's a topic I think we're afraid of and I, that's unfortunate. It's the judgment of God. Judgment can be for you just as much as it can be against you. I learned that on the people's court. <laughs> I have a very sophisticated education. I remember many times hearing Judge Wapner. You remember him? That's before Judge Judy or whoever else they put on the bench lately. But Judge Wapner would always rule in favor of someone. It was judgment in favor of the plaintiff or judgment in favor of the defendant. Judgment was for someone. And it, it's really a backwards way of understanding it if you only think of judgment in terms of something harsh. But judgment is as much a part of our interaction with God as his promises and his blessings. Now, Israel helps me understand this because God has been dealing with his covenant people in that land for more than three millennia. And there is abundant evidence of his judgment there, his judgment both for them and his judgment against them. And if you don't construct your imagination of God with an awareness of his judgment as, a, as an integral part of that, if you only understand God in terms of blessings or in terms of promises, and you don't integrate his judgment into that, you will have a very deficient imagination of God. It's an incomplete gospel. And part of the truth is dangerous. Once upon a time, I studied at Hebrew University. And before you could do that, you had to go to language school. Six days a week for several weeks, eight or nine hours a day, Immersive, only Hebrew in the classroom. I didn't even know the alphabet when I got there. First time they called on me to speak, I got so nervous, I said, I'm a pizza. <laughs> in Hebrew, of course. <laughs> That's been a while ago, and, and while I still know a bit of the alphabet and I can pick out occasionally a vocabulary word, I only get about every fourth word. Do you know how much trouble you can get in if you only understand every fourth word? Because every conversation in the Middle East sounds like an argument. And I don't know if they're getting ready to give me chocolate cake or hang me from a gallows. I just know there's a lot of passion around it. Well, that's kind of the position you're in with Scripture and your faith and the worship of God. If you only have room for blessings and promises and you don't understand his character and his sovereignty and his judgment, there's such a deficiency that it leaves you at a tremendous deficit. Judgment is, God's judgment is expressed in two ways in Scripture, in time and in eternity. When I say in time, I mean as a matter of history, not something when we're done with our journey under the sun, but God's judgment in the present and then God's judgment in eternity. The Bible says we all have two appointments. I didn't put it in your notes, but one is death and after death to give an account for your life. We will all give an account to God. But we first interact with God's judgment in time. We don't have to wait to eternity. In fact, I would submit to you, if you wait to eternity, you don't deal with his judgments in time, you won't, be pre be pre you won't be prepared for eternity. Judgment also reminds us that we're a people under authority. Now, we don't like that because we're a race of rebels. That starts in Genesis 2. 
But we are a people under authority. We're under many expressions of authority. We're under civil authority. The Bible tells us to, first of all, pray for those in authority over us, kings, whoever they may be. Whether you voted for them or you didn't, you have a biblical assignment to pray for those with authority over you from God. We're under spiritual authority. You're either under the authority of the kingdom of God or you're under the authority of the kingdom of darkness, but one of those has spiritual authority over your life. And it has very little to do with the church in which you sit or the denomination you prefer. We're under authority in our workplace, in our schools. God established authority in our homes. Don't we love that? Politically incorrect, veer away, veer away. Ultimately, the Bible reminds us that every one of us are under God's authority. Oh, we can deny He exists. We can proclaim ourselves agnostic or atheist. We can say there are many paths and no one can define the way, but none of those things change God's mind. Ultimately, we're under His authority. I gave you one verse. It's Psalm 100 in the third verse. It's familiar to many of you. Know that the Lord is God. You have to begin with that. You should know that there is a God and He is Lord. It is he who made us, and we're his. We didn't make ourselves. We didn't choose the circumstances of our birth. I've been to the places in the world where poverty is the order of the day. I've been to the Amazon Valley and met people who have very little likelihood of traveling more than 50 miles from where they were born, and they've never seen electricity used. And the only primary difference in their life and mine was the circumstances of my birth, and I didn't choose that. It's He who made us. We're His. We're the sheep of His pasture. We're His people. You're God's people. You belong to Him. He made you. So when He gives you a pathway towards righteousness or holiness or godliness or purity, He's not asking for your vote. He's telling you the designer's intent. And that frustrates us, and we look for workarounds, and so we try to discredit the messenger, because if we can discredit the messenger, we think we've been relieved of the message. Please don't do that. When you see the Lord, you will not be able to justify your ungodliness, because I was a poor presenter. Don't we wish that would work? The judgment of God. It's coming to our lives. It's not just an Old Testament principle. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is teaching. And he's telling a story about a man, a tremendously successful man, a very wealthy, a very powerful, a very influential person. But he's leading a life void of an awareness of God. And Jesus gives us a description. The man says, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and I'll store all my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Sounds like the American dream. You know, it's not necessarily a godly dream. I don't believe God gave you all the life experience and the opportunities and the privileges and the blessings that he's given to us so that we can just squander them on selfish indulgence. We need that experience and wisdom and courage and boldness that's been built through the furnace of trial and experience and life to see his kingdom extended and his name exalted. And God had a message for that man. It's in verse 20. He said, you're a fool. Because this very night your life will be demanded from you. And who will get what you've prepared for yourself? You're not taking it with you, he said. It's foolish to only live on the plane of what you can see in time. God's not against blessings or affluence or wealth or achievement or success. He makes all of those things possible. They come to us through his blessing. But he said, don't live for them alone. Don't sell your soul. Don't compromise your integrity. Don't be reluctant to stand for the truth. If you will honor me, he said, I will bless you. We read it in Deuteronomy 28. This man had all the blessings, but he imagined he was a self-made person. And God said, you're foolish. Tonight. I'm calling your marker. Folks, he's going to call all of our markers one day. Don't be surprised by it. It's an open book test. Get ready. It's not a threat. It's a certainty. None of us get out of this alive. Be prepared. Don't be frightened. Don't be anxious. Invest heavily. Well, I don't mean your money. 
Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah had the awkward assignment of being a prophet in Jerusalem to tell the people that the enemy was coming, and there was nothing they could do. It's not a message anybody would raise their hand to deliver. He said, now prophesy all these words against them and say to them, the Lord will roar from on high. He will thunder from his holy dwelling and roar mightily against his land. He'll shout like those who tread the grapes and shout against all who live on the earth. The tumult will resound to the ends of the earth, for the Lord will bring charges against the nations. He'll bring judgment on all mankind and put the wicked to the sword, declares the Lord. God's the judge of all. Now, I want to go to the New Testament, and I, I want you to listen to me with what Jesus had to say about the Jewish people in the land of Israel. This is our Lord Jesus. Contemporary Christian theology in America suggests that Jesus is all about love. Group hug, everybody. We're going to sing Kumbaya until we feel the glory rise. In Luke 19, Jesus is approaching Jerusalem. It's the triumphal entry. The, the, the hillside is alive with people acknowledging Jesus. Hosanna to the king. The children are shouting with such enthusiasm that the religious leaders are annoyed and say to the disciples, shut them down. And Jesus said, you shut them down and the rocks will pick it up. It's Luke 19, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it, and he said, if you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes, and the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. He's describing a siege against the city. You build an earthen embankment so you can roll the siege engines up against the wall and pound the wall to the gates to make a breach in the wall or break through the gates so you can capture the city you've besieged. Nobody in or nobody out. They'll dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They'll not leave one stone on another because you didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus is pronouncing judgment upon the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants. It's his triumphal entry. He hasn't been betrayed yet. His passion hasn't begun. Everybody's celebrating, and Jesus is kind of having a downer moment. He begins to weep. And he pronounces judgment. He gives us a little more insight in Luke 21. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. See, when Jesus was there, it was Herod's temple. Herod the Great had built one of the wonders of the ancient world. We still don't know how he did it. Stones cut, limestones cut as large as a bus, a school bus, and fit it in place so carefully there's no mortar required. How did they move them? How did they set them? How did they have the precision to do that? We don't have the technology to do it today. And they called Jesus' attention to it, and he said, there's not going to be one stone left on another. I could take you today to the street beside the Temple Mount where the stones were toppled down onto the pavement. It was 70 A.D. when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. They literally tore the temple apart, stone at a time. We don't know why. There's all sorts of theories. They were looking for gold. There's, but there, there was an unusual animosity, a hatred. There was an effort invested in destroying the temple, but it fulfilled what Jesus said. Luke 21, he said, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you'll know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. The siege was put in place around Jerusalem. The future was dim, but back in Rome, Caesar died. And the generals of the legions were throwing their hats in the ring. And so did the general that was in charge of the siege of Jerusalem. So the siege was lifted. Now, that siege took place in 70 A.D. Some 40 years earlier is when Jesus is issuing these statements. It's the first time there's a real break between the Jewish believers in Jesus and the larger Jewish population. Up until this point, th those who believed Jesus was the Messiah were simply another sect amongst the Jewish people. There were Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and Zealots and those people of the way who believed that Jesus from Nazareth was the Messiah. But in 70, when the siege was lifted... There was a significant portion of the population of Jerusalem who were believers in Jesus. They remembered what he said, and they ran for the hills. Understandably, the rest of the citizens felt like they'd been betrayed. 
and it created a real gap, a real wedge between the two populations. Now, I want you to think about those three passages. Jesus has spoken judgment upon Jerusalem 40 years before the events would take place. 40 years. You see, I think of judgment, if Jesus pronounced judgment upon our congregation, we'd be afraid to come back in the building this afternoon. It's imminent, we would imagine. Well, the judgment was a certainty. Jesus is weeping because of it. But the fulfillment was 40 years away. The certainty was such that Jesus was overcome with emotion because of the awareness of what was coming to the city. He couldn't enjoy the celebratory day because he understood what the future held. The behaviors of Jesus' contemporaries would ensure judgment as a reality. I think it's noteworthy to remember what happened in the intervening years. You know this stuff. You've read the book of Acts. But let me remind you of it. Between that day in Luke 19, when Jesus said, you're going to be destroyed, God did some remarkable things. Please, please think about this for just a moment. Jesus in Acts 1 went back to heaven. The ascension, the disciples saw him go. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out. It's the day of Pentecost. 3,000 men were baptized, proclaiming their faith in Jesus as Messiah in the streets of Jerusalem, baptized in the mikvahs, the, the pools of water around the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. It leads to an awakening in that city, a renewal in that city. Jerusalem experiences a dramatic change with thousands of people acknowledging Jesus as Messiah. Thousands of them. It draws the ire of the Sanhedrin. They try to shut the disciples up. They're jealous of them. They're gaining too much popularity. Their message is hotter than the message of the Sanhedrin. There are extraordinary miracles that happen. The lame walk. The dead are raised. The blind see. They bring people from the surrounding cities and put them in the street. If Peter's shadow perchance would fall upon them, they're being healed. It's dramatic stuff. And the persecution begins, and they're scattered, and wherever they go, the blessings of God come. Judgment's been pronounced, but the blessings of God are following the people of God. Do you have room for that in your imagination? They haven't capitulated. They haven't yielded the field. They didn't buy a cave and move in with their MREs. They raised the level of their intensity. They proclaimed the, the truth about G Jesus with a greater enthusiasm. The Holy Spirit's poured out upon the Gentiles in Caesarea, the non-Jews. The Jesus story spreads throughout the Roman world. Communities of believers all the way to Rome itself. Caesar's household is involved. All of that has happened since Luke 19. And yet, Jesus' declaration of judgment still comes upon Jerusalem and its inhabitants 40 years later in 70. Have you got that? Jesus weeping, you're going to be destroyed. And in the interval before the destruction comes, this remarkable, world-changing expression of the power of God. Now, why is that relevant to us? i got a couple minutes. I would submit my opinion. You could disagree with me, or you could save yourself some time and just agree. <laughs> Next week's lesson will be on humility. <laughs> Why is this relevant to us? I would submit to you, I believe God's judgment has already begun upon our nation. I don't know a better way to understand what we are witnesses to. It's illogical. It defies reason. It makes no sense. And then I could choose any one of a number of ways to express that. I, I can do it really quickly. Our leaders in our nation, with just a casual glance, if we can set aside personal feelings, our leaders are addled. And I think at best we could say corrupt. The executive branch of our government refuses to accept responsibility for the most basic expressions of leadership in a nation. They don't protect our borders. They don't defend our citizens. Instead, they betray the citizens of our nation to foreign nations. Again, not opinion. There's an abundance of evidence on this stuff. It's uncomfortable. We prefer not to look at it. We'd rather be busy. Let's just go to the beach. But it's our reality. 
We've abandoned our troops and allies in Afghanistan. We've empowered, emboldened our enemies around the earth. Our Justice Department and FBI and intelligence communities have become so politicized that they persecute and prosecute political enemies and cover up malfeasance of their overlords. We've never seen this before, not on the scale and magnitude that we watch it. And we, we, we are so befuddled, we don't even know how to find our voice. We're afraid to say these things. The Bill of Rights has been swept aside to empower a few at the cost of the many. Folks, it's our reality. Economically, the dollar, the American dollar, which is really the, the backbone of the empire that this nation has built, it's been the international standard of commerce since World War II. Some would suggest since the Industrial Revolution. And it seems highly probable that it'll be replaced by the Chinese currency. Changing, it will be as significant to our future as, as if we lost a world war. It's hardly discussed. We're more than $30 trillion in debt and demanding more. Let's give away something else. Votes are blatantly purchased with the government distribution of funds. And we say very little if we can get to the trough ourselves. Morally, truth has been driven into the shadows. And there are shadowy powers that are difficult to label. They are very willing to label ideas in the public square as misinformation. And therefore, it's banished from public discussion. Free speech has been exchanged for a mindless recitation of the prescribed talking points. Moral boundaries, they have declined to the point where we allow our children to be sexualized, coerced, manipulated, and mutilated. The church, we are struggling to find our voice in the midst of the turmoil. We've been weakened by our pursuit of comfort and convenience. We struggle to stand against the waves of deception and evil. Let somebody else stand. We want to go on vacation. We're too distant from the knowledge of Scripture, and we're easy prey for deceivers and deception. The church has become unfamiliar with the person of the Holy Spirit, and we forfeit so much of the help that's available to us. To be completely candid, I, I think the best description is we've been asleep on our watch, which is the gravest of offenses, and we have surrendered much. We've rejected the truth in favor of public approval, and we have brought about a form of godliness that is powerless. We warned about that in Scripture. But with that rosy scenario, I want to remind you of what God did after Jesus' declaration of judgment on the Mount of Olives in Luke 19. There's a remarkable move of the Spirit of God. It transformed Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. I would submit to you that in spite of the, the pronouncement of judgment and the impact that we can see, that if we will turn our hearts to the Lord, I believe we can experience a move of the Spirit of God which will exceed anything we could have imagined. Peter and James and John and Mary and the rest of the crew that day on the coming down the Mount of Olives with the triumphal entry did not imagine what was about to happen. You can follow their bewilderment through the book of Acts. And it's time for us to turn our faces and our hearts to the Lord. We'll be witnesses of expressions of evil that are beyond our previous experience. I have no doubt that's a part of our future. But I'm equally certain that if we'll turn our hearts to the Lord, we'll see the Spirit of God move in ways that is beyond our polite worship services Amen. and our sterile observances. If you'll allow me, we're ambassadors on an assignment. And God has it withdrawn from the earth, just as He's establishing the Jewish people in that land. The hatred of them exists and is growing on a daily basis. Anti-Semitism is flourishing in the earth. And so is the hatred of Christians, the most persecuted religion on the planet. I put that in a book, and the Christian editor gave it back to me and said, well, it's true, but it's because you're the largest religion. Even the Christians won't stand up for the Christians. Folks, it's, it's time for us to determine whether we're going to be ambassadors for Jesus. 
and see his promises fulfilled in our lives and our families and his blessings determine our future, or we will experience his judgment. I want to honor the Lord, and I know you do too. And so I think this July 4th week, we should invite the blessings of God upon our land once again. But to do that, we have to off raise our hands and say we will honor him, that we will turn away from our ungodliness and our compromise. We'll stop welcoming ungodliness at our kitchen table, and we'll begin to tell the truth to one another. We'll wrestle with the awkwardness of that and the discomfort of that. And in humility, we'll talk about those places we've had to repent and bring alignment and how we've seen God bless our lives. We'll let that conversation become normative, a part of our routine again. And let's see what God will do. Let's just see what God will do. Would you join me in that prayer? Why don't you stay in? If it's up to us, we don't have a chance. God doesn't need the majority. Amen. The truth doesn't even need the majority. The truth has a weight in and of itself. Amen? Amen. Amen. We've put our eyes, we've put our faith and our trust and our confidence in the wrong things. We've treated God as if he were some kind of an appendage to be tolerated. Folks, he is the center of our existence. We are his. He made us. Yes. And we're the sheep of his pasture. There's no, there's no reason to hide any part of our lives from him. Let's invite him in. He'll make them better. He doesn't need anything from us. He's not opposed to happiness or pleasure or contentment, but as the designer, he's shown us the best way to get to those objectives. And if you don't believe him, you need to start to reconcile that. Talk to him about it. You're not going to surprise him. He's seen stupid before. He's listened to me. Talk to him. Talk to him. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. You have blessed us. You have given us liberties and freedom and abundance and food. And you've given us so much, and we thank you for it. You've brought outcomes to our lives that bewilder our adversaries. And we thank you for it. And Lord, we come today in humility. Teach us to honor you again. Give us a love for your word. Yes. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our lives. Help us to see anything within us that is harmful or limits or diminishes what you created us for. Give us understanding hearts. May the fear of the Lord grow within us. We praise you for it. Lord, you called us out of darkness. You have begun to cleanse us and wash us and sanctify us, and we offer ourselves today. Have your way in our lives. Forgive us for our stubbornness. Let the awakening you've begun continue. Clear the slumber from our eyes and the grogginess from our hearts. And give us a clarity of thought and a focused intent. May you be pleased with us with our days under the sun. May we live in such ways that there's a great reward for every one of us when we step into eternity. We praise you for it. We thank you for it. Our desire is to honor you. May you be pleased with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. God bless you.